Uh, thank you um, for the opportunity. When Stan asked if I would speak at Friends Day, like every other faculty member, I was overjoyed. And uh, <laughs> said, absolutely. I've got tons of time and uh, would love to do that. So today I'm going to be speaking on Folksonomies and Ferber, the future of cataloging <laughs> in academic libraries. Uh, this paper is uh, undercooked. It needs some work. Um, it's really intended for a, a different audience, but I would love to think through some of this with you. Um, as I speak generally about seminary education in the U.S. Um, and in the West, and what I see um, that has changed, that will change, that shouldn't change, that should change. So um, we'll go back and forth through some of that. Um, I am going to do what I do with my students, and that is put my watch right where I can see it. Because Dan said I've only got an hour and a half. So, um, In the early 1930s, the National Socialist regime tightened its grip on the reins of power in Germany. Like many dictators before him, Napoleon comes to mind, Adolf Hitler understood the utility of religion if it could be turned toward the regime's interests. As such, Hitler's government worked to ensure that the German church was informed and formed by Nazi ideology, first with the formation of the German Evangelical Church and ultimately through the Reich Church. In this, the Nazi government was largely successful, perhaps due to particular weaknesses in the German Lutheran theology, but in other ways as well. Several church leaders resisted the co-opting of the church. These included Martin Niemöller, Karl Barth, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer, among many, many others. And they ultimately formed what would become known as the Confessing or the Confessional Church that stood in resistance um, to the Nazi regime. Recognizing the need for trained pastors and the inadequacy of contemporary theological education in Germany, Niemöller, Bonhoeffer, and others called for the development of seminaries specifically to serve the Confessing Church. Bonhoeffer was chosen to develop the seminaries, ultimately establishing the seminary in Finkenwald in 1935. The new ministerial training that Bonhoeffer advocated was actually a return to a much older model of education found within the church. Writing to his brother Karl Friedrich, Bonhoeffer argued that, quote, the restoration of the church will surely come from a sort of new monasticism which has in common with the old only the uncompromising attitude of a life lived according to the Sermon on the Mount in the following of Christ. I believe it is now time to call people to this. Though early on at Finkenwald and Bonhoeffer faced some criticisms, his project was ultimately recognized as providing exactly what was needed for the forming not only uh, for Orthodox, uh, students, but also for orthodox practicing students, orthopraxy, a life built around the disciplines of prayer, communal life, and confession. I'm not offering this example as a reductio ad Hitlerum. Uh, no way am I arguing or suggesting in any way whatsoever that our current culture reflects that of, bon of Bonhoeffer's Nazi Germany. In fact, Rob Dreher says it looks a lot more like Weimar Germany, and I don't think he's wrong. Indeed, my interest in Bonhoeffer's story has little to do with the regime under which he lived and died. Instead, I'm drawn to consider Bonhoeffer's rejection of the model of theological education on offer in Germany in the German university of his day. I'm drawn to this consideration especially in so far as the German university became the primary model for education in the United States and the Western world. Bonhoeffer's rejection of that education lay primarily in the inability of seminaries in Germany to form the character of its students due to its embracing of a sort of historicism in its study of scripture and faith. By way of contrast, Bonhoeffer emphasized the direct applic applicability of the text of Scripture. One of his students at the University of Berlin, prior to the establishment of Finkenwalde, remembered the refreshing shock of hearing Bonhoeffer teach. Bonhoeffer would say, quote, When you read your Bible, you must think that here and now God is speaking with me. 
Bonhoeffer taught us that we had to read the Bible as it was directed at us, as the Word of God directly to us, not something general, not something generally applicable, but rather with a personal relationship to us. Sounds normal to many of us, but this was a radically different way of reading Scripture than that which was found in German scholarship in Bonhoeffer's day, and it differs pretty profoundly from much of the scholarly work done in American universities and even in some seminaries today. So the purpose of this paper is hopefully to serve as something of a primer for discussion about the future of theological education, especially in pastoral training in the United States. I'm going to offer four exceptionally arguable points, uh, which I hope will serve to spur the conversation. Much of the substance of these suggestions and points are drawn from a really, a fairly long running conversation among seminary, uh, seminary professors, um, perhaps most seminally recorded in Robert Banks, uh, re-envisioning theological education. Banks, incidentally, was a good friend of our own David Worley. I will also draw from the conclusions of uh, some research that I did in the dissertation. It's my prayer that those of us invested in theological education, that includes faculty and administrators and staff, but supporters, ministers, and churches, might begin to consider how to address the unique challenges and opportunities in our own age at the collapse of, Christian, of Christendom through providing a new, interesting, and ultimately transformative model of seminary education. So let's talk for a minute about what has changed. From the very beginning, it's important to point out that the contemporary model of theological education, though more than two centuries old, is really a new innovation given the scope of theological education in the church. It's, it's fairly an infant when you consider the age of the church. We don't have time to recount all of theological education here, the history of it, although we, we could. Um, <laughs> only really to point out that ministerial training was performed initially, initially at the feet of the bishop and later through monasteries and then even later through cathedral schools. A theological education in the monasteries was holistic. Um, it was at once an aesthetic, rational, and spiritual, mystical act. And this would continue to be the case through the Middle Ages for, as is true of so many things, Augustine was extremely influential on theological education. Augustine re-envisioned theological education for the crises of his own day, specifically the decline and subsequent rebirth of Christendom. But he advocated a holistic, integrated approach to theological education, to ministerial formation, especially evident in the advocacy for the study of liberal arts and grammar and things like that in pursuit of a better understanding of Scripture. So for Augustine, the life of the mind was integrated with the life of the spirit and the expression of that inner life through justice, wisdom, love, and goodness. The development of the life of the mind was but one part of an education toward growth as a disciple of Jesus Christ and especially as a servant of his church. The early universities and the seminaries which then arose in the 15th century would continue this holistic education down to the Enlightenment. By the 18th century, though, university education as a whole had greatly declined. Um, indeed, stand, cover your ears. It had fallen so far that the King of Prussia, disgusted by the uselessness of his universities, appointed his court jester as president of one of them. <laughs> at, the dawning, at the dawning of the age of the so-called Enlightenment then, <laughs> the university, and by extension, the seminary, was ripe for transformation. So the radical shifts in epistemologies um, that occurred during the Enlightenment through Enlightenment philosophers really formed the foundation for the modern university. And the model which was developed in Berlin um, by specifically Johann Geidleb Fichte, whose name is very fun to say, Friedrich Schleiermacher, who you know and whose name is also fun to say, and Friedrich Wilhelm Humboldt, whose name is pretty boring. <laughs> 
Schleiermacher was particularly important for what we're talking about here. As one of the major figures in the development of the University of Berlin, Schleiermacher was forced to justify, at that time, the study of theology in the new scientific academy. To do so, he envisioned theology as a scientific study, dividing the formerly integrated branches of theology into three specializations, philosophical theology, historical theology, which for Schleiermacher included the study of scripture, which I think is telling, and practical theology. This would later be slightly modified by Abraham Kuyper into the fourfold division of theology that we still use today in the seminary and in universities. Biblical studies, historical theology, systematic theology, and practical theology. That's a big point that we can quickly miss, but the disintegration of theology combined with a hard separation I have bifurcation which seems useless a hard separation between the rational and the spiritual effectively balkanized the study of theology in the university and seminary professors are trained in graduate schools in the university the job of synthesizing and integrating all the various fields of study into a holistic uh, vision should have been most naturally taken on by the practical theologians. But in a bid towards respectability in the academy, practical theology itself became largely concerned with the technical functions of the pastoral office, administration, liturgical preparation, homiletics, things like that, rather than with the synthetic task of taking all of these different fields of theology, examining them and finding ways that it can speak a word to the contemporary church. So as Linda Cannell has said, as the disciplines of theology were consolidated, theological specialists trained in the academy tended to be less equipped to relate theology to press pressing issues in congregations and society. Thus, the balkanization of theological studies in Protestant institutions, and that's what we're talking about, often had the unintended consequence of making theology irrelevant and, in the worst cases, hostile to, life, to the life of faith in the local congregation. This was Bonhoeffer's concern. Several attempts had been made to mitigate that in the 20th century, um, including this institution's vision, which was developed by Dr. Weed and Dr. McNichol, of scholarship for the church so that when scholars engage in scholarship here they're always reminded the scholarship you're doing is meant for the church and that is a vital thing but these have met with varying degrees of success so where are we today the simple fact is that in general the seminary as it exists in its current form and i'm talking broadly here in protestant churches have been far more effective at disseminating information than in discipling its students into a transformed life. The model of the seminary in use today leans heavily on a context in which moral formation, discipleship, biblical literacy, all of those things is performed both in the culture but especially within the church. That is, the seminary model as it now exists assumes a level of Christianization which has been prevalent throughout the age of Christendom. And it is my contention, and I think this is borne out both anecdotally and empirically, that we can no longer assume this to be true. So what will change? This is where I'm putting on the prognosticator hat and breaking out the crystal ball. Uh, over the next few decades, I expect several challenges which will lead to significant changes in theological education. Um, and those of us who are engaged in the task of educating ministers must reflect upon the coming changes in the culture around us and consider ways we may adjust uh, to meet the needs of this generation of ministers. First, a post-denominational church. The past few decades have seen two con concomitant phenomena. The shedding of institutional affiliations by congregations long associated with denominations and the rapid increase in the establishment of non-denominationally affiliated churches. Ministers in these churches, especially the newly established non-denominational churches, have 
developed no perceived need for, and often no interest in, formal theological education, especially insofar as seminaries exist for the education of ministers in their own tradition towards their own doctrine. I think it's interesting when you think about this, and this, as I said, this is a much broader paper, but let's think about our own context for a minute. I think that Austin grad is actually uniquely equipped to serve ministers who come to us who recognize their need for theological education from traditions that are not Church of Christ. Ironically, I think, it's the Church of Christ and restoration commitments of the rejection of later Protestant creedal statements um, and things like that that prepare us to serve uh, people from other traditions. Um, in fact, it's precisely our commitment to be faithful to our own tradition as it was founded, which allows us to make a home for these ministers insofar as we require and indeed offer no equivalent to, say, a Lutheran seminary's several courses on Lutheran doctrine and confessions. We focus on the Bible. We do biblical theology. We do even our systematic theology is a bit biblical, right? Um, our church history, all of those things. The challenge for us, I think, is to communicate this truth to people whose experiences of Churches of Christ may be quite different than what one experiences here at Austin Grad, while maintaining our connection to the heritage that sustains us and enables us to equip ministers from these non-affiliated churches. A second point. Um, whew, a Stan, give me the high sign, because I don't know when I started. A postmodern world. Okay, whatever one thinks of the labels, postmodern, postmodernity, all that kind of thing, the simple fact of the matter is the foundations upon which Western society has been built since the Enlightenment are crumbling. We're seeing it happen around us through failure, corruption, hypocrisy, and abuse of authority. The great institutions of the modern world, founded in modernist philosophical presumptions, are increasingly in crisis as people lose faith in their efficacy. This has been true of the government, at least since the Vietnam War, and the distrust of government then has spread out to those institutions which are seen as complicit, fairly or unfairly, with maintaining the status quo. Often that includes Christians and churches. At the same time, the autonomy of the individual, which was so formative of American culture, has turned malignant. Philosopher Zygmunt Bauman has referred to the late 20th and early 21st centuries as liquid modernity, a time when the institutions that once held society together, that once led to a common and corporate life, have melted and provide no security, no stability to society. In our own day, this has extended so far as to produce what might be called liquid identity. That is, the state in which individuals are so free from corporate responsibilities and interests and history and tradition that they're no longer stable even in their own person. The ultimate end of this is the radically autonomous individual who must be emancipated from any constraints other than a very narrowly defined harm. And, as we are seeing, the only way to affect that emancipation is through political intervention. So, in this world, the church is walking very dangerous ground. She confesses an ancient tradition that offers freedom through obligation. And she proclaims a gospel of big T truth. Much of what the church has always confessed, especially regarding sexuality, but also among many, many other things, stands in opposition to the idea of radical autonomy and thus to the driving force of our age. And there will be consequences for this. There will be consequences for seminaries that maintain historical Christian orthodoxy on these matters. You can stretch your mind out and figure out what those might be. However, I don't suggest a council of despair. But the failure of Christendom, I think, opens up the possibility for real transformative Christianity to make its presence felt. Contemporary Christians who regularly attend church
find themselves looking for something deeper, something that will challenge them to not just to read about and know the Christian life, but to live it out. They're seeking resources for spiritual formation, written materials, retreats, lectures, classes here at Austin Grad, things like that. And many are increasingly recognizing that the Christian life calls for much more than did Christendom. Mm -hmm. Thus, I believe in some ways that the collapse of modernity and even of Christendom provide a rich opportunity for authentic theological education. That is for discipleship that is intellectually rigorous and spiritually demanding. Briefly, try not to sound like an auctioneer. What must not change? As seminaries consider ways to reach out to a new generation of Christians in this post-Christian world, many suggestions for change will present themselves. Some of these will be very helpful, but some must be resisted. And here are a few suggestions that I think faithful theological education must remain uh, non-negotiable. First and foremost, we must maintain an absolute commitment to Scripture. Above all else, theological education must maintain this. The Bible has maintained the church's faith for, over two, for two millennia now, or over, considering the Old Testament. And a seminary that does not maintain a rigorous program of study of the Bible at its very core will not equip saints for service in the church. So the primary commitment is to the Bible. Secondly, we must maintain, regardless of the direction of our culture, the faith of the church once delivered and passed from generation to generation. This is perhaps more difficult for those of us in free church traditions who feel very little connection to the past. But it's not for us to scorn our ancestors in the faith and reject those things that the church has always taught insofar as they're in keeping with the Bible, with the biblical narrative of God's rescue of the world from its sinfulness. Thirdly, rigorous scholarship. I think it's possible to hear what I'm presenting today and think, oh, okay, what you're saying is we should do a dumbed-down version of seminary. Uh, no. Um, I think in part this is due to a now centuries-long belief that is inherent in Enlightenment uh, thinking that rigorous scholarship is not intimately connected with discipleship. But every thinker prior to the Enlightenment would disagree with that. Augustine, for instance, didn't see it this way, and he towers over any modern scholar, partly because he understood that scholarship itself is an act of discipleship and is a part of the process of forming oneself into the image of Christ. It's thus a false dichotomy to enter into an either-or relationship between rigorous scholarship and dedicated discipleship. They are, in fact, two sides of the same coin. I want to also suggest one more thing that we must not do. In response to the phenomenon noted above about seminaries' lack of life formation, many liberal Protestant seminaries have shifted their curricula toward the creation of social justice activists. In this enterprise, they have found much success. I mean, one can always find uh, seminary students at rallies holding signs. Seminaries, though, form disciples, not activists. An activist is largely focused outward on levels of power and political processes and things like that. A disciple is focused forward and inward, trying to bring his or her life into step with her Lord. A disciple's primary work is to become like Jesus and then to help others do likewise. It's not to say that activism shouldn't be done it's, or that Christians or ministers shouldn't participate in political life. I'm not David Lipscomb. But the goal of discipleship is to exercise dominion through following Jesus Christ and with the help of His Spirit in the one kingdom in which a person truly reigns himself. So what must change? This is where um, I need my colleagues to close their ears. <laughs> it's been a long discussion, it's good. While these things should remain unchanged, it's true that theological education should make some adjustments to the contemporary world. 
if the goal of seminary is to help build discipling disciples, the model of theological education which was embraced in the Enlightenment must be adjusted and even transformed. Here I want to offer just a few changes. First, toward a holistic integrated curriculum in faculty. Seminary faculties, I'm not talking about graduate schools here, but seminary faculties must start considering ways to reintegrate the disciplines of theology into a holistic vision of theological study that then goes into a, a spiritually formative curriculum. This is counter everything you guys have gone through, right? Um, it, is, it is completely counter to the specialized training that most seminary faculty um, have been through. And it will be difficult to do this, but reclaiming the ancient church's vision of theology as fully integrated and vital to the Christian life is imperative to the future of theological education. Those who serve God's people need and deserve, they need and deserve an education that interrelates biblical studies, historical theology, systematic theology, and practical theology in such a way that will provide them the tools they need in the congregations they serve. How the seminary goes about doing this is hard to say. Perhaps um, the integration of several co-taught courses with professors from different disciplines or things like that, seminars, other similar approaches to that that would incorporate kind of a, a reflective atmosphere uh, bringing all those things together. I think also incorporating daily rhythms and routines of spiritual disciplines, not just into uh, the daily life of students and faculty, but also even into our courses might help integrate the life of faith with the life of the mind. Seminary faculty need now to be considering ways of accomplishing this, um, and I think research needs to be done on it. Uh, secondly, mentoring and apprenticing. One of the most formative factors in the spiritual lives of every person that I spoke to in my dissertation is mentoring. It's a recurrent theme throughout all the literature of spiritual formation. We just know that part of what it takes to grow into a spiritually mature person, into a leader that the seminary wants to form, is done through mentoring. Obviously this varies from course to course and from prof to prof, but, and I think you'd, you'd have much more of a presence of this in the ministry courses, but there should be moments even in the technical and critical courses that incorporate ways of mentoring students into doing the scholarly work and integrating it into their own lives. Um, the next point is very obscure. Professor evaluation needs to change. That's what I'm arguing. Uh, we'll come back. Okay. <laughs> you don't care about that. <clears throat> I barely care about that because I'm a librarian. Uh, all of these changes will be difficult. And they'll be difficult specifically in the context of accreditation and standardization. That is, around the bureaucracy that's been created to maintain quality in education. Accrediting bodies ask much of the schools they're accrediting. How many contact hours with students professors have? How many resources the libraries offer? How well the faculty develop syllabi that say goals and various objectives on them, right? How successful schools are at placing students in jobs? And the list goes on and on and on, I'm looking for Dave, and on, and on. Dave is the one who carries all the hard work for us on that. It's interesting though, because I've, I have worked some with Dave on the IE, and I've never seen this question. How well does your school form Christian disciples? You'll never see that. In part, it's because it's a qualitative rather than a quantitative measure, and people like statistics because they more readily adapt them to their worldviews, to empirical conclusions that they've already had. As a seminary, though, we have to remember that our primary mission is not to produce degreed students, whether BA or MA, but rather dedicated, discipling disciples. Sometimes our courses won't look the same as those offered in a university context. And these, difficulties, uh, these differences will be difficult to maintain 
in a standardized environment. But seminaries need to begin assessing to what degree standardization developed in the modern academic context is actually helpful or harmful to its primary mission. In conclusion, Christian education is not primarily technical. From its earliest expressions, the church has encouraged education towards human transformation as a holistic endeavor, as a lifelong movement towards decentering the self and the transformation of personal character. Christian thinkers have envisioned humans not as autonomous individuals, free of tradition and history like modernity, nor as constantly in flux, recreating themselves by free choice agency moment by moment, postmodernism. Rather, Christians and Christ himself understand humans to be the sum total of decisions they have made and actions they have taken. Humans are a product of, as Nietzsche ironically said, a long obedience in the same direction. As such, we need to envision education in our churches and in schools and in seminaries with the goal of transformation rather than simple information. The church of the coming century is going to be smaller. It's going to be leaner. Pope Benedict said that, so I'm cribbing from him. I could do worse. It's going to be a body of people searching to be disciples rather than being born into a culture that assumes the basic morality and worldview of Christendom. Seminaries then must begin now to reimagine themselves as institutions concerned with developing church leaders who, who are equipped in both knowledge and character to disciple believers into the life of discipling believers. Thank you, Todd, uh, for the amount of work uh, that went into that and for the thinking. Well, one thing I was thinking about as Todd talked, um, Todd's one of ours, uh, did his degree here uh, before going on for um, uh, upper level work. Um, you've sat at the feet of Weed and McNichol and Ship and um, Peterson. You've also been in dialogue with Napier and Stanglin as this continues to go forward. And it just shows how important the school is. Um, this new vision, I am in total agreement with Todd, even though he said we have a seminary president that's a jester. <laughs> Johnny should be the next one. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'll put you in the succession plan, Johnny. No, that we, with the cultural changes going on, have to rethink how it's done. And with the challenges in the culture that we now live in, which has changed so rapidly, I was making some predictions 20 years ago that I said it'll be at the end of my lifetime and it came before I got real old. Uh, and it just seems to continue to accelerate. Um, one of the things that you said, Todd, was that the radical autonomy that's coming out of this culture, there's going to be consequences. The church has always been called to be leaven uh, within a culture. And if the culture removes that leaven, I'm in total agreement with you, there's going to be consequences that the entirety of the culture faces. I think it's also true for the church, though, that if we allow the culture to shape us, and I hear you saying that, that there's going to be consequences in the church. And I go back, to, I've quoted James Thompson on this before, but Thompson has said, that it seems like pulpit search committees are looking for a comedian, a CEO, and a therapist. Mm -hmm. And right now, if a guy can get up and make a good speech, um, sometimes that's all that's required. What we hear our professors recognizing and saying, it takes more than just the basic skills. I have a student right now in my preaching class that we had a guest there the other night, and he said, you're dangerous. And I said, I've already told him that. Because he has such good rhetorical skills, he could slide by 
on the rhetorical skills. Johnny, I told you the same thing. <laughs> that, that it takes more than just having the rhetorical skills. And with the emphasis that Todd is calling for on we've got to keep Scripture as the core. And if you go examine other seminaries and their curriculum, it's all social justice. Very little Scripture anymore. So we're out of the norm in what's being done here, which is countercultural, but we have to keep it. And that's another reason this school has to continue to exist. And uh, we face a lot of challenges as a culture and as a church. Um, it is so important that you do what you do in helping us. And I'm talking to our friends.